Sounds great. Um, thanks again, Stephanie, for inviting me to give these webinars to the Master Gardeners. As I said last time, I really love talking to the Master Gardeners. Um, there's always so much enthusiasm. And I also wanted to thank the people who attended the last webinar, or watched the video, and then filled out the evaluation survey. That's really helpful to me, so uh, thank you very much. And uh, also, I wanted to tell you that I'll send out the um, uh, slides and a PowerPoint handout uh, after the after the seminar today. And also I'll send some uh, links to some resources that I'll mention during the talk. So uh, last time we talked about soil and how important it is to rejuvenate the soil. And this time we're going to talk about uh, gardening. And I specifically want to just remind people that this will be about um, vegetable, fruit and vegetable gardening, right? So food gardening, rather than landscaping, which is the topic we'll take on next time uh, in the webinar about regenerative landscaping. So um, this one is uh, basically going to be focused on gardening. And I want to just point out there's a lot to talk about. Uh, and there's you know, a lot of details uh, that I could provide about how to do various little uh, gardening things, but I, wa I want to focus on the context of um, the kinds of changes that are occurring in the climate and how gardeners can respond to those. I'll give as many details as I can, but uh, you know, you always have the HGIC personnel who are super specialists that can provide a lot of additional details um, if I don't have the time to talk about them. And um, you know, they're your big resource anyway. So uh, we'll just get going. Um, because I want to talk about how gardeners can respond to climate change, I want to first talk a little bit about climate change. And um, I, uh, I like to start out by uh, showing you what people in Maryland think about climate change. 99% um, of scientists uh, accept that climate change is real and it's here now, it's affecting us now. And this map shows you the counties in Maryland and what people in every county think about um, or have, how they have answered the question, do you think that global warming is occurring, um, when asked by the people at the Yale Program for Climate Change Communication. So uh, this is one of the Yale Climate Opinion Maps, and these are available for every state. They've been asking a variety of questions about climate change um, uh, for uh, over a decade, and now they have uh, so much um, uh, resolution that they can get right down to the county level. So um, I live in Howard County right here, and um, many of you are in Howard also, but I know you're scattered across the state. 80% of people in Howard accept that climate change is, um, is occurring. Uh, there's a variety of um, uh, sort of uh, degrees of acceptance across the state, but every single county, uh, more than 50% of people accept that climate change is occurring. So across Maryland, 75% of Marylanders accept that climate change is real, but it's interesting. Only 57% think that the scientists agree, which is kind of a problem because um, as long as people feel that the scientists um, aren't, aren't in agreement, that there isn't consensus, then it's easy to say, well, you know, until the scientists uh, uh, get together on this, then I don't really need to do anything. But people should understand there is absolutely no scientific controversy remaining about this. And, um, uh, and, and that's a, um, an important gateway to, to climate action. Um, I know many of you have seen some of these um, climate change slides from me before. And if you know everything about climate change and you've got a good grip on how it works, well, that's awesome. Um, you can just be uh, uh, sort of agreeing in the background, but many people don't, um, don't know the details yet. And so I wanna review this. Um, this is a, um, an animation that only takes about 25 seconds, but it will give you a really good view of what has happened already. So this is not a forecast. This is actually a reflection of um, data on global temperatures from 1884 to 2011. And I'll start it in just a second, but just to understand what the um, colors mean, um, there's a key here, and the people at NASA Goddard down there in um, Greenbelt who um, made this animation uh, took the average temperature between 1951 and 1980 as a baseline. 
And then if the temperatures at a given time or place, like in 1884 up here in the Northern Hemisphere, were below that baseline temperature, then the color is blue. If they were above that baseline temperature, the color is um, yellow or orange. So uh, those uh, colors from cooler to warmer will be reflected um, as we go through this. Okay, where is the, uh, that's interesting. Where is the, um, I can't seem to get it to start. Oh, there we go, there we go, good. Okay, so it'll just click along. You see mostly now it's cooler than the baseline. A lot of variability um, in places warming and cooling. If you look at the where we are, it gets warmer and cooler. Here we are in the 70s. But by 2011, you can see that the warming trend has basically uh, 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 eclipsed or gotten larger than all of that little variability that we know is inherent in weather. And we can see a, a tremendous amount of warming, particularly across the Northern Hemisphere where there is more land um, by 2011. So I wanna stress that this is evidence, this is not my opinion and it's not a model. This is what has already happened. So just to catch you up then, um, since the animation ended around um, here, uh, I wanna point out that the last five years have been the hottest since 1884. So this is a, a, a graphical record of the average global temperatures each year, the red dots, and then there's variability around that. Um, and what you can see starting uh, again here in the um, late 1800s is pretty much constancy until we start to see, uh, particularly around 1970, really a very rapid increase in temperature. Um, and so here are the last five years, they're clearly the hottest we've had since 1884 and 2020 is right in there. May 2020 was the warmest ever since 1884. So this trend that you see here, this upward trend in temperature could absolutely not have occurred by chance. If only chance were operating here, what we would see on this graph is essentially a continuation of this. A lot of variability, but it would have just gone around like this. That's not what we see. This pronounced trend is definitely not a chance event. Um, the red dotted line here is in here for context. It illustrates a temperature which is one degree centigrade above the pre-industrial level, that is, you know, the level back here. And you can see we're already um, over that. And in fact, many places in the Northeastern US have already warmed almost two degrees. Um, so if you think of the goal of the Paris Climate Agreement, which is to limit warming to two degrees centigrade, uh, well, we're already over one. And so it's really time to start taking some action here. Um, as I said, the last five years have been the hottest since 1884. 19 of the 20 hottest years have been since the year 2000. So I have the feeling next year, I'll be saying 20 of the 20 hottest years have been since the year 2000. So things are really warming up and this has an impact on plants, on animals, on biodiversity, and that's what we're gonna be talking about. Um, people ask me this question a lot. And so I want to, to um, provide you the evidence that uh, tells us that we know that this is not part of a natural cycle. Um, throughout the past 800,000 years, so here's the axis starting at the present over here and going back 800,000 years, we have seen a cycle in carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere and a corresponding cycle in temperature. And um, throughout all that time, the carbon dioxide concentration has stayed below about 300 parts per million. Um, in 2020, we, uh, got, we reached a carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere as great as 419 parts per million. It's about 417 now, so it goes up and down a little bit. Um, and this is much, much higher than what we've seen over essentially all of history. And um, we know these carbon dioxide carbon dioxide concentrations in the past, even though humans were not around, because they're recorded in the ice way below Antarctica. When snow was falling 800,000 800, years ago, it reflected the um, atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide in the air. And as that snow fell and then more snow fell, that air became trapped 
and um, scientists can retrieve it from ice cores that are taken in the, in the Antarctic. So we have a pretty good knowledge of this. We know that the carbon dioxide concentration in the air in the ice matches reality because in recent times we can dig up very fresh ice and find that in fact the carbon dioxide concentrations in, in the air in that ice reflect real measurements. So here's the, the, um, the science here. We know that this concentration of carbon dioxide is not part of a natural cycle. And by the way, this cycle is what causes the ice ages, okay? We know what causes it, and it is not related to climate change. Um, this is so far out of the natural range of the, this oscillation that it could not have been caused by the mechanisms that caused this, okay? Because it's just way, it's way too far out of the natural range. If this mechanism could have caused this, it would have already done that in the previous 800,000 years. So, in fact, um, scientists regard the warming that we are seeing as a consequence of the increase in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere as essentially a fact now there's very little uncertainty um, that humans have been responsible for in fact most of the warming scientists say 100 percent of the warming in the last 50 years okay so um yeah so there we are now why does more carbon dioxide in the uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere cause warming it's so simple, and this is all anybody needs to understand about climate change. This is simple enough that you can explain it to your family, you can explain it to your neighbor down at the mailbox uh, or whatever, um, uh, when anyone says to you, well, climate change is really not happening. It's, it's essentially um, just a result of chemistry and physics. So what happens is the sun warms the earth up. We all know that. It's been really hot around here recently. And the, um, the heat that is then generated in the Earth is radiated back into space. So obviously, if there's a heat source and, and the sun is heating the Earth up, then the Earth needs to lose the same amount of heat in order to retain um, a constant temperature. And so heat is radiated from the Earth as um, infrared waves. And they have to make their way through the atmosphere so they can go out in space and you know, be gone. And what happens is that um, a set of very special gases that are found in the atmosphere called greenhouse gases um, interfere with those infrared waves as they're moving out to space. And what happens is that, um, well, let me first say what the main greenhouse gases are. Carbon dioxide, we've been talking about that. Methane. Um, which is generated by decomposition and also by um, um, the guts of ruminant animals. Nitrous oxide, which comes from soil and is also um, added, uh, emitted from um, the um, addition of uh, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. These are the main greenhouse gases and they are building up in the atmosphere. When a, um, a heat wave, um, an infrared wave, runs into one of these molecules of greenhouse gas, what happens is there's a, a sort of physical chemical reaction and the, the um, infrared wave is briefly absorbed and then bounced off in some random direction, okay? So if it's a random direction, it means half the time those heat waves will bounce back toward Earth and then they may run into another greenhouse gas molecule and another. So uh, this is just a little cartoon here. These dots are meant to be the greenhouse gas molecules. And so this one ran into one, came back towards Earth. There's a little bouncing around, a little bit more bouncing around. But the bottom line here is the more of these greenhouse gas molecules are emitted from burning fossil fuels and growing ruminant animals, and et cetera, the more gas greenhouse gas molecules there are in the atmosphere, the slower the heat loss because the infrared waves are bouncing around more before they can get out. That means they stay in the atmosphere longer and the earth warms up. That's it. So simple. Anybody can really understand that. And um, you don't have to be literally a rocket scientist to get why climate change is occurring. Okay. Um, where is all this warm, go, global warming going? It turns out it's not staying in the atmosphere. Okay. If it were, we would already be really, really hot. In fact, most of it has been absorbed by the ocean. Water is a big heat sink, and the ocean has taken up 93, a little bit more than 93% of that extra heat in the atmosphere. This is really what has caused global warming to turn into climate change, because the implications of a warmer ocean 
are many and it affects uh, a great many of the processes on Earth. For example, warmer ocean, more water is evaporating from the ocean. And because the air is warmer, there's more water vapor in the air. Um, so for those of you who thought maybe it couldn't get more humid in Washington, in DC in the summer, ha, it has, it's 7% more humid now than it was just um, uh, 50 years ago. And the more um, global warming we have, the more humid it becomes, that affects weather, et cetera. So this has many, many effects on um, uh, uh, various aspects of important earth processes. So. There have been fundamental changes in the climate caused by a buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We have warmer air, we have a warmer ocean, we have more water vapor in the air, and we have higher sea level. Not just because warmer water takes up more space, that dominated sea level rise for the, uh, until about 20 years ago, but also because the warmer air is melting land-based glaciers like uh, the one on Greenland, and in fact, you can see this glob of uh, cold water at the tip of Greenland. This is Greenland. And that has been caused by melting of zillions of gallons of ice um, and, um, and it, it dripping into the Atlantic Ocean. So we have a higher sea level. This has produced what scientists call the new normal. And um, these changes uh, are clearly affect the weather, patterns of temperature and precipitation, and they're going to affect plants. So they're going to affect gardening. Um, so to get to climate change and gardening, there are really two aspects of uh, climate change that affect gardeners. The first one is the impacts on plants and, um, and uh, plant growth. And because of those, we really can't fight those impacts. We can't, uh, the effects of climate change that have already occurred are here and we're really not going to be reversing those. So it's important to learn how to adapt, how to be successful in the garden in the face of these changes. Okay, But gardeners can also be part of the climate solution by implementing practices in the garden that reduce emissions and thus can slow the pace of further climate change. And that's why I love talking about gardening because it's not only, oh, we have to deal with these problems that are happening, but we can do these things which actually can be part of the solution. So I'll talk about both of these aspects. So the new normal in the garden. Temperatures are going up. We have warmer winters, earlier springs, a longer growing season. We have more extremely hot days, and that means longer heat waves, more extremely hot days in a row. We have fewer cool nights which is important both in the winter and in the summer, and we have increased temperature variability. Um, patterns of precipitation have changed. We have heavier downpours and also more possibility of drought. So these are the, the major changes that affect gardening, and I'll go down through them and illustrate some examples and um, some, give you some ideas about how you can deal with these changes. Okay, we have a longer frost-free season. Um, this is a map from um, a, um, a group called Climate Central, which has a lot of really great climate change information. And they divide the country up into sections. Um, and in our neck of the woods, on average, we have about 10 more days, even more now because this, was, uh, this is a few years old. But the point is just to illustrate that we have a longer growing season with shorter and warmer winters. We have fewer cold nights, and when it comes to the winter, that means there's not as many so-called chill hours. That is, it's more difficult for plants like apples and peaches and other uh, orchard plants um, to accumulate enough chill hours to produce the right, the sort of appropriate level and timing of blooms. And that's a big problem as the winters get warmer. Um, plant breeders are madly trying to breed um, uh, peaches and apples and other fruit crops that require fewer chill hours. And that's going to be sort of the wave of the future in um, orchard crops. Um, Part of the consequences of warmer winters are that the hardiness zones are changing. There's a creep to the north of the hardiness zones. And um, here's a map of the hardiness zones. Let me first review what those are. All of you master gardeners know this, but just a, a real quick recap. The hardiness zones um, determine which plants can survive in a, the winter in a particular place. And they are calculated by 
um, determining the average lowest temperature reached in the previous 15 years. So if we're in hardiness zone six, it means that the previous 15 years, the average of those years was someplace between um, zero and uh, minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, zone seven, 10 degrees through zero degrees Fahrenheit. So it starts at the warmer and goes the cool cooler. So in 1990, um, here's the map and you can see that we were pretty much, Maryland was pretty much on the border between zone six and zone seven. Um, and uh, as things began to change, this was no longer really that accurate. So in 2006, the Arbor Day Foundation, after trying to encourage the USDA to make a new map, um, to no avail, made their own new climate, their own new hardiness zone map. And you can see how much the uh, hardiness zones in Maryland have changed, okay? So now uh, over here, well, this is not Maryland, but over here on the Eastern shore, we have a little bit of zone eight, but much more of Maryland is zone seven. Um, and, uh, and these zones are just moving up, up, up. Why is that? Because as the winters warm, the average lowest temperature in each place, obviously, is going to um, slowly creep upward. Um, so uh, that means that plants that couldn't survive in Maryland, okay, back when it was in, uh, all this part was in zone six, now the plants can survive in those regions according to the um, parameters of zone seven. This means not only plants, but also weeds can survive and insect pests can survive and diseases can survive that were not able to survive in Maryland before. And this is now an ongoing process. It's just gonna keep changing. The hardiness zones are going to creep upwards. Um, I wanted to show you this picture because I think it's one of the coolest data sets of all time. Um, warmer winters means earlier blooming of spring blooming trees. And this data set was published a few years ago in The Economist, um, and it shows measures of peak bloom time in Yoshino cherries in Kyoto, Japan, from the year 800 through the year 2017. So back in the year 800, people in Japan were measuring the peak bloom of the cherry blossoms, which I think is incredible keeping these really good records. And there's a lot of variability that each one of these little miniature blossoms is a uh, one year data point and a lot of variability, but this is the average. And then this is the sort of confidence interval around that. Um, and um, the average you can see kind of goes up and down a little bit, but it pretty much stays between the 10th and the 20th of April. Um, but what we see in more recent years and again, this is, so this is 1800, 1900, 2000. Um, uh, by about 1970, when, um, when post-industrial warming really starts to kick in, you can see that here, this is still within the range of what we had before, but um, uh, by the middle of the last century, things really started to um, warm up. And the blooming just started to really become earlier, earlier, earlier. And that peak bloom year, uh, day uh, went way below that range that had been maintained since the year 800, which is amazing. Um, the cherry trees in DC are also blooming um, on average 10, uh, seven to eight days now earlier than in the 1960s. And again, it's kind of interesting. Um, I'm not showing you these data, but the change in flowering time between those trees in Kyoto and the trees in, in DC is, is sort of parallel, which means that it's not a, um, a geographically localized thing. They're, they're changing in concert, which indicates a sort of global change, and that's because of, of global warming. Um, so there are impacts of warmer winters. One of them is that the weeds are really staying alive during the winter. And the weeds are actually benefiting from the warmer winters more than either native plants or crops. Um, weeds have better overwintering survival. They have earlier flowering time. They're starting to grow, um, break, if they had dormancy, they're starting to break their dormancy um, earlier than native plants. So the weeds have got a real competitive edge. Now, I don't know about you, but it appeared to me in my garden that not a single weed died over the winter. They were all just actively growing. And then there was just this morass of weeds out there at the beginning of the season, which I will confess to you, I have not caught up yet. So <laughs> I've been just beating them back to um, 
colonize different parts of my garden. Um, so one thing that I think would really help, and I ran out of time last fall, so I didn't do this, um, is to, after you clean up your um, garden plants from the year, mulch down those rows or plant a, covering, a cover crop so that you've got something to slow down those overwintering weeds. Um, how do you adapt to increasing weed pressure? Well, I just said mulch in the fall or plant a cover crop. Stop tilling. Mulch and stop tilling are gonna be two uh, phrases that I repeat over and over here. Um, tilling, even just with a, a scuffle hoe or a hand hoe, does bring up weed seeds. The deeper you till, the more weed seeds you bring up, and they come up to the surface and get the light, and then they germinate right away. Um, it's important to weed early in the season. If you clear a bed, um, you're gonna get weeds growing in there pretty much right away. Uh, if you don't mulch, and you've got to keep up with that. So weed early, weed often, and try to get them when they're really small, because once they get big, they're, you know, they're competing with your crop plant if they're in the rows, and they're really hard to get rid of. So I wanted to just show you my um, three favorite tools for getting rid of weeds. Um, one of them is, oh, I, this got cut off a little bit, sorry. One of them is the Garden Bandit. It's a strip of stainless steel. This is not sharp but you turn it on its side and you sort of move it uh, all around the soil and it goes just a little bit below the surface of the soil and cuts the little weeds off. Now, it's not gonna cut a big weed off. Um, scuffle hoe is basically, uh, let me see, the garden bandit that you use when you're standing up. It goes a little bit below the surface. You don't ever have to pick it up, so it's not very much work. And it cuts the weeds off. If you're not careful, I can get a little too enthusiastic with the scuffle hoe, so I don't use it close to my plants because you know I have cut down you know uh, transplants or rows of bean seeds like this with when I'm not paying attention, I get too enthusiastic. So I use the garden bandit or a hand hoe down on my hands and knees when I'm close to the plants. Here's a picture that shows us several different ways to mulch. Um, there you can use newspaper, which you can either wet, dip in a bucket and wet and put down or wet afterwards. You can, this looks like paper bags, but you can also use that paper that comes folded up or comes crumpled up in Amazon packages or other packaging. You can straighten it out and use that. It's about 12 inches wide. You can use all straw, but if you use all straw, you need about four or five inches, which is a lot of straw. But you can also cover up this paper with straw mulch so it looks a little bit better. These are three methods. The method I tried this year is I got some heavy duty paper, which is four feet wide, four feet wide and 100 feet long roll. And so I just rolled out these long strips of this four foot wide paper, made holes and put my plants in the holes. So these are basil plants. And um, then I put, I'll show you later uh, in more detail, but I put um, soaker hoses underneath the paper. And this has been working great because weeds can't come up where there's paper, they can only come up in the holes. So it takes about two minutes to go and read this, um, this bunch of, uh, of basil plants, whereas if they were just out there in a row, well, it, it would take a lot longer. So I'm really starting to like this paper. Um, okay, now the animals are doing a lot better in the warmer winters too. The deer, as we all know, are just doing great. They've become much more bold. Um, I have a dog and they've stayed out of my yard until this year and I just uh, completed putting a deer fence around my garden because I had it with them coming in and eating everything at night. Um, there's more food for them during the winter. They stay healthier because it's not as cold. So they survive better during the winter. They have more offspring and their offspring stay healthier. So these are all the ingredients of a great big population explosion of deer, uh, which is um, not really that great a thing. Um, the white-footed mice um, have also really been able to uh, explode in numbers because of the warmer winters. And so they benefit from the from the warmer winters. And that means that there's more Lyme disease out there because the research shows that most of the ticks that have picked up the Lyme disease bacteria uh, got it from mice, okay? Not necessarily, they go on deer, but they, uh, as larvae, they get the, the bacteria, many of them get it from mice. And I've had a mouse plague on my property recently. So um, uh, uh, be careful about ticks. Okay, insects are also doing much better. 
um, in the warmer winters, surviving better over the winter. They come out earlier in the spring. There's in some insects that are able to add additional generations as long as it's warm enough, there's more generations per year. And many insects have expanded their range northward, which is um, causing a big problem. So what are we gonna do about all this, you know, additional uh, problems from warmer winters? Well, when it comes to insects, it's really important to be vigilant. Now, I know that master gardeners are taught the signs of damage, right? So you can get out there and look at your plants and say, oh yeah, okay, I can see something's eating this. You can look underneath the leaves, you can see the larvae or the, you can see the squash bugs or whatever is out there. You can recognize what's happening and then you can figure out what to do about it. Um, one thing that I have finally decided I'm, I'm um, really dedicated to is using row covers. So I put row covers, this is not, this is from Wisconsin Master Gardeners, but I put row covers out now on things that are going to get chowed down like cucurbits until they bloom. And that has really helped because it keeps the pests off. But you got to get the row covers out right away um, uh, when the seeds come up or when the you put out the transplants or otherwise the insect pests can get under the row cover and then they're protected from birds and that's not a good thing. Um, this is um, a, a picture I found on the internet of insect netting. So row cover uh, very effectively keeps the insects out, but so does this and you can see your plants growing, which is kind of nice. Turns out this is tulle, T-U-L-L-E, which is like the material that bridal veils are made out of. And so this person went to the um, fabric store and bought a whole bunch of this tool and, and used it for an insect barrier. Um, it's important to know what you're going to do if you find the pest before they get there because while you're figuring it out they can really take over your garden. So you should you know decide are you going to spray some organic thing on there or a non-organic thing whatever you choose. Are you going to go out and knock them into a little container of soapy water? Um, you know what's your plan? Um, if you see something out there you don't recognize or you don't know what to do, hey, we have the Home and Garden Information Center. And, uh, and they know, as far as I can tell, they know all about pests, diseases, et cetera. And so you should feel free to, uh, to contact them, obviously. Um, okay, now another thing that really is helpful is if you allow the natural enemies of insect pest to come into your garden, your yard and garden, um, and uh, uh, so they can do their work to either prey on or uh, some other way get rid of these insect pests. So um, there are a whole bunch of different insect predators and um, parasitoids, I'll talk about those in a minute, um, that you can lure into your garden by planting various flowers and native plants. So um, uh, there are flowers that are not native that are very good hosts for um, pollinators and natural enemies, um, but of course native plants are desirable in a lot of cases also. Um, uh, but what you want is you want plants that will provide nectar, pollen, and protection for these insects. And so here's a bunch of predators. We have ladybugs and a ladybug larva. Um, this is a, 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 these are, the, yeah, these are all predators. This is a surfid fly, okay? It looks like a bee or wasp, but it isn't. So it's, a, it's mimetic, it is posing. It's all a big uh, fake, because this thing is a little tiny fly about, I don't know, maybe three eighths of an inch long, or there are several species. Sometimes they're a little bit bigger or smaller. And um, they look like a bee, but if you get close to them, you will see they are not a bee, they're a fly because they only have two pair, two wings, one pair of wings. Um, bees and wasps have two pairs of wings, okay? Now, these are, this is a larva of a surfid fly up close, and these things are little maggots and they cruise around and they are voracious predators on aphids. Um, and they just eat those aphids like crazy. Um, which is a good thing. So if you if you go out there, you'll probably see ladybugs and ladybug larvae, but take a look and see if you see any of these um, somewhat clear looking maggots crawling around. This is a lacewing, another predator. Here are some lacewing eggs. This is a minute pirate bug. Um, it's a bug, so it has a, it has a um, um, sucking mouth parts and it jabs these mouth parts into the aphids and sucks up the interior. Um, this is a, um, a spider, wolf spider with an egg sac, and wolf spiders are really 
great insect predators. And so I know a lot of people are scared of spiders, maybe not a lot of master gardeners, but um, uh, spiders are good and it's really worth um, providing the kind of uh, litter and mulch and stuff that stays over the winter. So you have cover for these predators that live on the ground like spiders and ground beetles because they come out at like the beetles mostly at night and just chow down a lot of good stuff. So you want to make them happy. Um, so you can plant a lot of different flowers in your garden. If you're not sure, you can plant a mix like this or just anywhere you have a space. This is, um, oh geez, now and lavender. Um, anywhere you have space for flowers, plant something and it will um, help the pollinators, which is going to help your crops and it'll help the natural enemies. Um, so uh, parasitoid wasps and flies are also your friends. So it's not just the predators. And um, I know most of you know what a parasitoid is, but it's different from a parasite. A parasite, like a tapeworm, lives in the host and just sort of maims it, might make it sick, but doesn't kill it. A parasitoid has to kill the host in order to complete its life cycle. So um, I know most of you have seen these um, Pupil cases on tomato hornworms in your garden, they're produced by this parasitoid wasp. And it's kind of cool because tomato hornworms are big, right? And so um, a parasitoid of tomato hornworm can lay a lot of eggs in one host. And these larvae, the eggs hatch into larvae, um, which are uh, sort of maggot-like. And, um, and they just swim around inside the goo of the uh, caterpillar while the caterpillar is still eating, right? So the caterpillar is providing them with a lot of food. And um, when they get ready to pupate, they kind of blast out through the cuticle and make their pupil cases on the outside like this. And then they um, turn from a larva into a pupa, the pupa, um, then turns into an adult, and the adult um, chews a little hole in there and um, gets out of the end of this pupil case, and then goes off to attack another tomato hornworm. So um, it maybe is not as satisfying to a gardener to have a um, process like this that takes some time. It doesn't kill the host right, right away, but if you encourage these things, if you don't, if you don't smush these caterpillars with the pupil cases or whatever, um, then they build up and they really do suppress the, the population. Um, I used to work on pea aphids, which live on peas, but also alfalfa and clover. And they have a parasitoid wasp. This is one that is curling its abdomen around to sting the pea aphid. And when it stings that aphid, it inserts an egg. Usually they only insert one egg because the aphids aren't that big. But then the aphids turn into um, these... Uh, really recognizable structures. The aphid is dead by this time, but they turn into these hard sort of brown structures called aphid mummies. Okay, here's one that I saw a week or so ago in my garden. I was happy because I knew that, that my natural enemies were out there working for me. And um, they, uh, uh, again, like these guys, they uh, pupate inside the aphid mummies and then chew a hole out and the adult wasp comes out. The other, uh, this is not a, um, um, an insect natural enemy. This is a fungus, but I wanted to show you because I saw these in my garden too. Um, there's a pathogenic fungus that attacks pea aphids. Um, and these are two cadavers um, that have been killed by the fungus. And you can see a few fungal spores around this one. This one is pretty much probably lost all of its fungal spores. But the cool thing about the parasitoids and the fungus is, and I think other natural enemies also, other parasitoids, it is that they um, change the behavior of the pea aphids. Um, the parasitoids cause the pea aphids to climb high up on the plant um, right before they turn into mummies. So that then the wasp can pretty much get away easily. While the fungus causes the parasitoid to go um, to seek the underside of a leaf. And then when it's really humid, um, the uh, all of the fungus inside that dead pea aphid, uh, the aphid will so-called sporulate, that is shoot all the spores of the fungus downward. It's, it's on the bottom of the leaf. So it shoots those fungal spores downward onto all its hapless uh, <laughs> friends and relatives below it. And that then perpetuates the infection. This is one of my favorites. This is a little fly um, that is very tiny. 
it lays just one egg inside a corn earworm egg and, and then essentially chews it up from the inside. The uh, egg hatches and the larva chews it up and then it emerges as a, as a little fly. So we have from going from the big prey where you get a lot of parasitoids to just the little ones where you get one single one out. But the parasitoids are really, really helpful. And if you look in your garden, I bet you'll see signs of this. Um, okay, let's talk about summer heat. I wanted to show you some evidence that in fact summers really are getting hotter. And this is a cool study that was done by James Hansen, who's one of the most famous climate scientists. Um, it was published in 2012. Um, but what he did was he and his people went back and retrieved temperature records from um, the uh, period 1951 to 1980. Remember, it's that same baseline that was used in the uh, map I showed you initially. Um, and so every day they recorded um, what the temperature was and they then centered that distribution. You get a, a bell-shaped curve of temperatures. This is frequency up here. So most of the temperatures were at the mean and they set the, they just set the axis so that the average would be at zero, okay? rather than the actual temperature, which I think is too bad, but that's the way they did it. So this is the average temperature between 1951 and 1980. And then because it's a bell-shaped curve, the data illustrate that there's equal numbers of cooler days and warmer days, okay? Now, if we look at this distribution, what I want you to see is that um, there were very, very few days that were hotter than this, three, and again, this is a stats thing, but three standard deviations away from the mean. Only one-tenth of 1% 1 of days were hotter than this between 1951 and 1980. Then the Hansen crew plotted the temperatures for all the days between 2001 and 2011. And when they did this, here's that reference period, 1951 to 1980. They found that some days were still just the average temperature. Some days were even still cooler than the average temperature. But the mean had shifted to the warmer side. And now 10% of summer days were hotter than that uh, measurement previously, where only a tenth of a, a percent of days were hotter. So many more hot days between 2001 and 2011. This is even more um, significant now. So again, this is evidence. This shows us by looking at long-term data that things have actually changed. It's very hard to just rely on your memory to say, oh yeah, it's hotter than it used to be. We just can't remember because there's too much variability. We have to, in order to gather evidence, we have to look at the long-term data. So more hotter days is going to have an impact on, on garden plants. Um, there's a lot more heat stress now than there used to be. And if you look at vegetables, um, this heat stress affects pollination in several uh, key vegetables and it affects fruit set. So if you look at tomatoes, these are pictures taken by Jerry Brust, who's an IPM vegetable specialist at University of Maryland. And so here's a picture of a tomato uh, uh, branch. And um, Here's a, where a flower is. Okay, here's another flower. And here's the place where a flower was, but the flower fell off because it was too hot. Okay, so they start to drop their flowers when it gets too hot. The other thing that happens in tomatoes is even if the flower remains and it gets pollinated by an insect, um, the pollen doesn't, um, the, you know, the pollen is, is a little grain. It has to germinate and then grow a pollen tube down to where the seed will be formed. The pollen tubes don't grow right if it's too hot. And so you wind up with tomatoes like this, um, uh, where you've got no seeds in the cavities. And no seeds means also none of that juicy goo around the seeds. And so the tomatoes aren't that tasty. You can also see another impact of heat, which is this fibrous white stuff that uh, accumulates around the, sorry, around the surface of the seed. And um, I don't know about you, but I find that really annoying because you try to peel the tomato and you've got this white stuff, it doesn't want to peel. And then you, have, you want to make tomato sauce and there's nothing in your processing tomatoes except this white stuff, it's really annoying. Um, and obviously if you're a farmer and you're trying to sell the fruit, it's, it's not very, um, people don't really want to buy it. Um, the other impact of heat is on corn, both sweet corn and field corn, but um, corn does not pollinate when it's too hot either. And so you wind up with a lot of ears where the tips haven't been pollinated um, because it's maybe gotten too hot. 
Um, and also sometimes what happens is if it's too hot and the plant is really stressed, it can't complete, darn it, I keep clicking this thing. Um, it can't complete the development of the kernels. And so you get kernel abortion. And so you get some kernels down on the, on the cob, which are fine, up towards the tip, not so fine. A lot of kernels get aborted. Sometimes even down the kernel, you get kernels aborted. Um, and so uh, uh, heat has a neg strongly negative impact on a number of vegetables. Peppers, uh, sweet and hot peppers, drop their flowers and their fruit if day temperature is greater than 90 for a period of time and the night temperature is greater than 75. Um, and uh, I, I want to show you this picture because when it's hot out in your garden, you've got to take care of yourself too. I can't be out there when it's really hot. And so I um, wanted to plant some beans about a week or so ago. And I wanted to show you how I was doing this with this paper. Um, uh, it turns out these are too close together. Now these beans are producing fruit and there's tons of beans in there, but they're, they're a little bit crowded. But anyway, what I did was I took this paper, I just cut slots in there to put the beans in. And now I only have to weed the little bit of area that's around the beans, easy. But it was really hot that day and I thought, oh, I've got a beach umbrella. Why don't I just jab that in there and produce a little shade for myself? And it turns out that really helped. Okay, so maybe not the kind of gardening advice you, you are looking for, but <laughs> it really helped me. Um, yeah, we had a question actually about that paper. A couple of folks yeah. asked, where do you get it? Um, yeah, I've just been shopping for more of this paper. Um, there are a couple of brands. Now, I'm not pushing, the, right? I'm not in the business of selling stuff. But mm -hmm. um, one brand is Weed Guard Plus, and I, I like the heavyweight. There are a couple of different weights. The heaviest, the better. And the other one is, oh, geez, what's it called? Oh, it's from DeWitt. And um, I got some at Amazon, but there are other places mm -hmm. that you can get some. I'll send a, um, a, a, a little list and some information about that. But um, you can okay, get it in 50 or 100 foot rolls in different widths. So yeah, I mean, give it a try. I really like it. You can see the here question the that we had kind of oh. related. Is this true for squash and zucchini too? And I'm not sure if she's referring to one of the issues you were talking about with the tomatoes. The row covers maybe? Uh, is what- Carrie, if you could just put a little bit of a clarification into the chat box for your question, then we can get it answered. Yeah. I. Uh, Flower okay, so yeah, she can, mm -hmm, yep. Um, I don't think the flowers, flowers drop off of those plants. Um, I, I haven't seen anything about that. So um, I, okay. I will just have to say, I don't know, but I haven't seen anything about it. Um, okay, okay, great. So, thanks, Terry. That's all we okay. had. Yep. Okay, thanks, guys. Um, okay, now what are you going to do with it getting so much warmer? First of all, um, because spring comes earlier, you can plant earlier in the spring um, and try to beat the heat or plant later in the fall and just sort of avoid that really hot, terrible period in the middle of the summer. Um, I'm sure you've noticed that the last and first frost days that you can look up on the internet aren't really that accurate. And that's because like the hardiness zones, they're based on the previous 15 years. And so when it's warming, right, the frost date of the previous 15 years ago is really not that relevant. And so um, you can usually plant stuff a little earlier than the so-called safe last frost date. Um, mulch really helps when it's hot because it keeps the soil cool, keeps the roots cool, and that's really um, important for the plants. It also ref um, retains water, that's good. You can try heat tolerant varieties. So here's a picture from a seed catalog of some so-called heat tolerant lettuces. I think that, that they're getting more um, heat tolerant varieties that really are heat tolerant. Um, and, and so you can give those a try. Um, but another thing is you can use either shade that you build. So these, the, the, in this picture, they've just put out some hoops. You can actually make these hoops pretty easily out of, um, electrical conduit, plastic stuff that you can just bend and put in the ground. And they clip the shade cloth to it with these little clips that you can buy. Um, this is shade cloth and you can buy it to, you know, exclude a you know, certain amount of sun. You can 30% shade cloth, 50, 60, whatever, to, to um, provide 30% shade, 60% shade, et cetera. And so um, uh, that then shades the plants and it, it keeps it cooler in there. 
you got to make sure that there that this tunnel of shade cloth is open though so you get ventilation because otherwise it gets hot inside there and and that cooks the plants and and then <laughs> i did that the first year i thought oh, i'm going to really make a good shade cloth enclosure and i i i put shade cloth down to the soil all four sides and it got really hot in there and killed everything so um <laughs> live and learn right um, this is from a study that was done at University of Georgia, and this investigator um, put, uh, sorry, a shade cloth tent around peppers, but also put the peppers on this plastic mulch that's silver that reflects the light. And um, th that's thought, that's advertised as um, being good to confuse certain insect pests. I don't know if that's really true or not, but it keeps the soil cool. And also the shade cloth reduces the temperature. Again, you notice that it's open in the front and the back and, um, and, and that really works. I tried last year draping some, I think it was 30% shade cloth over my tomato cages and that really helped. That reduced the um, degree of sort of problems with the tomatoes. Um, but again, you know, if I try it in my garden and I say, oh yeah, it worked one year, that's not good as gold, right? You, you want to have, um, actual more research base before you put all your eggs in that particular basket. I'm just trying to give you some ideas that you can try or not. Um, but mostly I'm trying to give you things to think about. You know, if, if it's getting hotter, well, what can I do in my garden to, to protect the plants from that heat? Okay, now drought is also more likely with climate change because the summers are warmer and they're longer, but there's no increase in the average amount of summer rain. We're getting more rain in the spring, more rain in the fall and winter, but no more rain in the summer. So California has really been taking it hard. The Western states, very, very hard. Um, this is an almond orchard in California during their 10 year drought, which they are now afraid is coming back. Um, and even though we think of Maryland as wet, um, we're not going to escape droughts. We had a flash drought at the end of last year in October. And um, again, this was reflected on the U.S. Drought Monitor map. This is kind of a cool site. And again, you'll be getting these slides, so you don't need to write everything down because it, if it's on the slide, you're going to be getting this information. But every day, the U.S. Drought Monitor puts out a map of what the drought conditions are across the country. And this was for October 1st last year. And you know, here we are in Maryland, extreme drought is red, severe is dark orange, and sort of um, abnormally dry to moderate drought is what we had. And that's more than we usually have in the fall. So that was notable. Given that um, drought can be an issue, it's really important to water wisely, okay? Because water is a very limited natural resource, clean water clean fresh water. And so you don't want to waste it. Um, and so again, mulch really helps you when it comes time to watering because mulch retains the water in the soil and it also keeps the soil cooler so it doesn't evaporate as much. Um, uh, drip irrigation, basically what you want to do is you want to put the water at the base of the plant. You don't want to water, um, you don't want to sort of wave your water around in the top. Um, you want to put it to the base as much as you can. And um, actually constructing a big drip thing like this uh, is a little bit of an engineering um, problem. <laughs> and um, I haven't gotten myself to do that yet. I, I keep saying I'm going to, but um, this year, here's my paper again, those, those beans that came up after I planted them in the shade there. And what I did when I set the paper out there was I ran two soaker hoses, I really, one soaker hose in a U so that there was a soaker hose on each side. Um, and as I plant down the row, then we get you know everything watered. So I can control this by just plugging my hose in at the end and turning it on a timer. Um, okay, now here are things we don't, examples we don't wanna follow for watering. I was sort of surprised I found this picture on the Michigan State Extension website. They've got a sprinkler set up on a, it looks like crate here or something. During the day, you know, oscillating and, and sprinkling. That is very ineffective because um, a huge fraction of water that is emitted in a sprinkler during the day never reaches the ground because it evaporates. So if you're going to use a sprinkler, you want to use it in super early morning. But in general, it's just kind of wasting that a lot of that water. 
The other thing, I'm sort of on a soapbox about this right now, is these garden nozzles. Everybody has these garden nozzles, but they have a very restricted opening and they let out a really small amount of water. And so you can stand there thinking, I'm really watering my garden, but actually so little water is coming out that it takes a long time to really do anything. So I've gotten, uh, I'm, as any of you out there who know me know, I'm not that patient. <laughs> and so I don't like to stand around for hours watering. So I invested in, um, in this watering system. <laughs> um, three quarter inch hose instead of five eighths, that's what this is. A full flow um, turn off valve so I can turn it on and off at the thing and a, a water breaker so that I get a lot of water coming out but not um, so not like a fire hose that doesn't flatten the plants. And um, so I took this picture when I was watering my pollinator garden experimental plots, which I'll tell you about in the next webinar. But I just wanted to show you that a lot of water comes out of here and you can get a half an inch of water in a, you know, deposited on your plants in a very short period of time. So there's not a lot of evaporation there. Here, mm, takes too much time and it's really not effective. Okay, um, it's better to water deeply every few days than it is to water a little bit like this every day because if you water deeply, then the plant roots go deeper and um, it also saves you time. Okay, now I talked about drought, but now let's talk about heavy downpours, um, especially in spring and fall, but also in the thunderstorms of summer. A lot of rain can come down in a very short period of time. And this pattern of downpours is increasing. We, uh, this map from Climate Central shows that um, um, compared to 1958 to 2012, um, much more of our rain is coming down as boom, downpours. And that can produce flooding. So um, here's a vegetable garden that was flooded and it can cause all kinds of trouble. If you wanted to plant, if a downpour comes when you wanted to plant, it can delay your planting, it can wash out your seedlings, it can contaminate fields. When you can see over here, there's, there's water all over the place. So probably there was water that came across the landscape um, and landed in this garden. And that's very dangerous because you don't know what's in that water. Anything in your neighbor's place or down the road or whatever can come and get onto your garden. And that's, that can be dangerous. Um, the water can stunt or kill the plants, obviously. It increases disease and it can cause soil compaction when you try to get back in there and work it. So your healthy soil helps because healthy soil, more water infiltrates, you get less standing water. Um, what are you gonna do if your garden winds up like this, submerged in flood water? Um, if you just have a few puddles that form in your garden and stay and make the plants wet, that's not maybe that much of a problem. But when you have, as I said, water traveling across the landscape, then that's a problem. Um, if this happens you know, on a routine basis, then you wanna improve the drainage around your garden, obviously. But you, my point here is that you have to be really careful about the food safety of the crops that you're growing in this flooded garden. Any produce that has been touched by flood water should be thrown away, okay? Because you don't know what's on that. And many foods like lettuce and stuff like strawberries, there's no way you can wash those really. Um, carrots, they're in the ground. You might be able to wash them or, and cook them, but you know, if you take them in your kitchen, then who knows what's on them. So I, um, I, I recently found a great fact sheet from Ohio State um, and here's the URL, but I'll send you the PDF file of this um, um, with the resources. And it gives you a lot more information about um, uh, sort of what to do. But um, I'm a big subscriber to When in Doubt, Throw It Out and um, or compost it as the case may be. And um, I don't want to eat something that's been contaminated by toxic flood water. One thing you can do for very you know, susceptible, fragile things like lettuce is put them in raised beds so they're above the level of the flood water. But if your garden, if this happens in your garden, obviously you want to increase drainage um, pretty much right away. Um, okay, so uh, let's um, turn to the second part of the talk now, which is shorter than the first part, good. And we we'll just have two questions that came yeah. in if you want to take those before we switch. Sure. 
Okay, um, so one is regarding the temperatures for gardening. Um, although the average last frost day may be getting later, should we still be worried about the excessive variability in the weather? Um, and for example, more likelihood that there will be a surprise late frost. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So it's a little bit of a balancing act. You you have to take some responsibility for watching the weather channel if you put if you put plants out too early, and um, and you have to be ready with your bed sheets or whatever um, your frost cover to go run out there and cover them up if there's going to be a frost. So uh, yeah, you have to you have to worry about that because the the chance of a late frost is is you know definitely present. Okay, great. And then the second one, um, where did you purchase the hose attachment that was in your slide when you were talking about water? Oh, you can get those a, a lot of different places. And again, I, <laughs> I, I hate to recommend, you know, certain places, but sure. um, I think those are made by Gilmore, G-I-L-M-O-U-R. And um, there are a lot of things that, a lot of attachments that advertise as full flow, but um, before you buy one, if you, if you buy it online, try to see a picture down the you know, down the bore of the thing. So you can see whether that opening is standard ones. The opening is usually like a quarter of an inch and a full flow one, it'll be bigger, like three eighths of an inch. And um, uh, so you can shop around. I, I, I usually buy stuff online, especially now, but um, there are a lot of them out there. Gilmore is a good brand. Um, they leak sometimes, but they're not very expensive. So, um, you know, there it is. Got it. Anything else? Okay, that's all we had for now. Thank you. Okay, good. So let's launch into this part and see what we can figure out about how to be part of the solution. Um, ah, now, it's really useful if you want to, you know, sort of be a climate change warrior to start your garden out with climate friendly transplants. Now, many of us go to the garden center and buy these plants that are, you know, very convenient. They're already, you know, growing but they're in these plastic pots. And although you can recycle these in Howard County, if you clean them out and whatever, most people don't recycle them. So there's this plastic that then is, you know, disposed of, and that's not that great. Also these, a lot of these um, transplants have been sprayed. They're planted in, in uh, potting mix is peat based. And I'll talk about that in, in a second. Um, and so, you know, if you really want to uh, have a climate friendly garden, you can explore starting your own transplants from seed. Now this is really easy and there's a lot of information on the HGI we uh, HGIC website about this. All you need is a few shop lights and a shelf and um, the, the shop lights are great now. You can buy them as um, LEDs and you can get a four foot long um, pair of tubes, right, for maybe less than $40 and they last forever. So, um, that will, you know, you can use them for years and years. And then the idea is to not use all this disposable plastic, but to get yourself some reusable pots or plug flats. So I used to plant everything in three inch pots because I had a bunch of them, but these are two inch pots and you can fit 50 of them in one of those 10 by 20 um, flats. And um, you just put your potting mix in there and plant the seeds. This is a kind of a fake. I, I took this picture when I was growing some corn from seed, which, you know, who does that, right? Well, I did it because the corn, the corn I planted outside the last two years got eaten totally by vermins. So I planted some in my high tunnel of seed and then the mice came in and ate the seed. So I'm like, mm. I decided I would plant some in pots, which is ridiculous, and transplant a few, you know, 50 out into my high tunnel, which actually did work. But that's why I'm growing corn from seed. This is what's called a plug flat. It's a flat with, you know, you can get them in various sizes. In other words, if they have very few um, openings per 10 by 20, then they're, they're bigger. But you can get them in smaller or bigger. And then this is a really convenient way to grow a lot of single seeds in trans and then transplant those out. So these can all be washed, so you don't have to throw anything away. You can buy some enough for your needs and then wash them and use them again the next year. Um, these are some pots that I, water, I washed and, um, and here's some of the three inch pots I used to use. Um, and you know, it's, it, it takes a little time, but again, you know, it's like everything. Um, you have to decide for yourself uh, what, how you feel about just buying stuff and throwing it away. So um, 
If you want to use a sustainable potting mix, it means using one with less peat moss because peat moss is um, a, a natural product which grows it from moss, right? It grows in peat bogs, which are um, usually found in northern regions. And um, they're a gigantic um, source of methane when the bogs are drained and mined for peat moss. Now, most of the peat moss from the peat uh, from the drained peat bogs doesn't go into potting soil. It goes into other things, but still, if you don't want to contribute to the destruction of these peat bogs and the release of methane, um, then you can use potting mix that ha does not use as much peat moss. Now, I've been experimenting with trying to find a, a good solution to this problem, and I would not say I have found it yet. Um, there are various alternatives to peat moss, coconut core, which you can buy it, compressed in these blocks. Um, it comes from like, Sri Lanka or someplace, but it's a waste product of the production of coconut. Um, now you might say, okay, well, does this mean I'm supporting the cutting down the rainforest for coconut palms? It, it's like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what's worse, honestly. Um, but the, it's a waste product, so they're not cutting it down for coconut core. And um, the transport is not that big of a climate footprint because they're standing on ocean, on ocean liners, just lots of it rather than flying it, which is the worst. Coconut core is one option. It comes compressed, you put it in a bucket, put some water in there, and it, it loosens up and turns into this. Rice hulls, also another byproduct, um, very good to sort of lighten up the soil. Here's a pile of rice hulls. I tried this paper potting mix called pit moss, um, and here's a pile of that. Um, it turns out that really holds the water, so you don't want to use very much of that in a mix. Uh, they say you can plant right in it, but I thought, it, it, I didn't like it. Um, and, you know, then you can use sand and compost, some garden soil, whatever. So there's a lot of different things you can add. Um, I, um, I uh, sometimes I'm sort of start on the conservative side and say, okay, I'm going to take a regular seed starting mix and cut that 50% with core. So even though it has peat, it has a climate footprint, it has half of what it would have if I used it straight. So that's something. You can make a more sort of uh, aggressively um, climate friendly mix by mixing, you know, 20 to 25% of a regular mix, core, sand, compost, paper, rice hulls, whatever you've got to get the right sort of lightness that will drain appropriately for the plants that you want to plant. Um, and so you can you lighten it up with the sand. I think the, the uh, rice hulls lighten it up. Uh, the paper uh, makes it heavier. The core is pretty neutral. Um, so you just have to kind of watch out. Watch out for how much uh, water it retains. If it doesn't retain enough, you have to add something that's going to retain the water better. And also it's going to have a different fertility from the regular mix because normally those have, um, those have um, uh, peat moss in them and, and fertilizer. And so that adds the fertility. Okay. Uh, well, we talked last time about how important it is to build soil health. So um, here's just a few pictures about that. Don't till, um, use organic material for mulch, either compost or leaves or whatever. Um, and um, uh, composted leaves are really, really great. Even if you don't run them over with your lawnmower and you just pile them up somewhere, um, it makes good compost. You can just pile them up on your flower beds or your garden beds in the fall and that, and that works well. Um, plant cover crops, um, either in the summer if you have some bare ground for a little while, or over the winter, which adds organic material, nitrogen, infused the soil microbes. So we, we already know this from last time. Um, and uh, keeping the soil covered controls erosion. Okay, here's those tools again. Um, it's uh, important if you want to do climate friendly gardening to reduce carbon emissions from power tools. It turns out that power tools um, cause power yard tools, okay, not, not drills and stuff. Yard tools cause 5% of all US carbon emissions, which is kind of shocking. Um, and so uh, you can switch over to hand tools. Now, I, I put this picture in because when I look at most of these hand tools, I just think, oh, yeah, yeah, this is so much work. You know, like a hoe, blah, blah, a lot of work. And so that's why I like these tools because they are much easier on my physical person than a lot of these other hand tools. Um, you can use electric tools and electric mower uh, um, or whatever. So um, next time I'll talk about reducing lawn. Um, 
I talked about weeding smart, do your mulch, don't leave any bare soil around your garden plants because it's just gonna grow a little weed like this. Um, don't leave bare soil in your beds over winter because it's gonna grow a lot of weeds. Limit synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, which has a huge carbon footprint because it's made from um, heating stuff up with natural gas to a very high temperature. And so it's better not to use synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. Um, I talked about nodules uh, uh, on legumes during the soil talk, and I was out um, collecting peas, gathering peas from my um, snap peas um, last week, and I thought, oh, I'll dig some of these up and see if I can find the nodules on there. And I was really relieved to find that, in fact, there were a lot of nodules on them, so I thought I'll take a picture and show it to these folks in the webinar. And um, uh, so that there they are, the nodules. Um, now, I don't know if this is a lot or few, but there at least are some nodules up down there and they are filled with those bacteria I told you about last time and they're fixing nitrogen. Um, okay, now choosing cover crops. Uh, this is the link and I'll also include that link in the resources I send you um, after the seminar. And it's a, a nice article from Rodale Institute about choosing cover crops for um, organic no-till. Just, you could substitute your garden. Um, Okay, now climate friendly gardening, don't till, okay? Going in there with a tiller, which used to, you know, I think be sort of a rite of spring for many people, is not a good thing for your garden. Um, and we talked about this last time again, so I'll just go through this real quick. Tilling wrecks the soil structure, so not tilling keeps the soil structure. Not tilling keeps the uh, carbon that could, will, would be decomposed by um, or, or organisms that can get it if it's tilled, keeps it underground, keeps the weed seeds underground. And well, plus it saves fuel and who wants to do this, right? I can't even move those tillers around. I mean, it's just, it's really an ordeal. So you don't have to do that anymore, which is a bonus. Um, so mulching with, you know, some kind of organic mulch with the paper. So here's the, um, here's the end of those soaker hoses and it just has a wide divider, a full flow, another full flow wide divider. Although this doesn't let out much. So you can put a non full flow divider in here. And then I hook my hose up there. Cardboard, always a big, standby for um, keeping weeds out of the way. Okay, no-till gardening. Um, this is now catching on and just like no-till agriculture. And there are various um, uh, approaches to this. And so I'm not gonna tell you all the ways that you could do no-till gardening. Um, this is a, a great website, oldworldgardenfarms.com. And actually these people wrote a great book, which I will include in the um, resources. Um, but the idea about no-till gardening is that, um, well, obviously you don't till. Uh, these folks planted an annual rye cover crop during the winter. They set it up so they have permanent beds like this that they uh, they leave all you know as beds every single year. This is permanent walkways that they walk on. They cover th with thick mulch. Um, there's never any bare soil. There's cover crops on there choose your cover crop depending on uh, on your purpose. It's sort of an art form, so I really can't go into a lot of details about what cover crops are best. Um, and then in the spring, you can terminate your cover crop by going in there with your mower, set it down as low as you can, and you know, you just scalp the cover crops or a string trimmer, okay? And, um, and then once you've scalped this, you can do it a couple of times because uh, these folks, in, uh, anyway, claim that uh, if you mow this really low a couple times, it's going to fade out. Um, um, or if you had clover or something in there, you could mow it a couple times. But then you mow it really low, you make your little uh, trench or uh, whatever for putting in your transplants or your seeds. Then you mulch on top of the mowed down cover crop. And that mulch is going to further kill the cover crop and keep it out of your you know, hair for the rest of the season, uh, in theory you have to work out a strategy that works for you. Um, okay, these people have piled a lot of mulch on top of their beds in each season, and, and that's a good thing. This 10th um, Acre Farm is a really nice website, and she has a lot of blogs, including one on transitioning to a no-till garden. So there's a lot of information out there. I'm not gonna go into any detail. Oh, good, okay, so here we are at the end. Um, and I just wanna say that uh, it can really feel overwhelming. 
And especially, you know, now when we've got so much chaos and so many things changing that it can feel like, God, how can I possibly do anything? And I try to take some amount of comfort in the fact that I can't control my government really, uh, uh, local government, maybe state government, maybe federal government, less chance. Um, but I can control my home, my yard, what I do in it, what I eat, how I garden. And that puts a lot of um, power in, uh, with me that I can at least influence my part of the world. And I can talk to people, maybe you can influence your part of the world. So I came upon this, what I, I think is a great picture um, uh, from an Australian website um, uh, that was um, keyed to, um, I think, high school. And so they made this, I think, very lighthearted uh, mind map about what the heck you can do. And there's a lot of things you can do. Now, I did a little editing, of course, buy fresh food, not processed, keep your thermostat at 66 in the winter, 78 in the summer. This saves a ton of money, by the way. And, um, and it really helps. Ceiling fans really help to use less power. Um, you can combine errands. Here's things you can do in, with transportation. A fuel efficient car, you can carpool, keep your car maintained, walk or bike when you can. Um, combine errands is a great one. Um, airline travel is very, has a big carbon footprint. Uh, vote, also very important. Um, you can plant trees, reduce your lawn, uh, consider eating less meat, use less stuff. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff on here. Oh, use a clothesline, not a dryer. I don't know if you, um, if you are all aware of this, but um, Maryland is what they call a right to dry state. That is, you have the legal right to dry your clothes on a clothesline. No HOA can tell you you can't do that. Now they can tell you you have to put your clothesline under your deck or someplace where they're not going to see it from the front, but they can't tell you that you can't dry it. So I think, um, uh, um, especially among older people, line drying clothes has kind of a stigma of poverty, but we could rebrand that and just talk about it as solar clothes drying. So there it is. Uh, I'll take questions now. Um, uh, and I just want to thank you for uh, your patience. And um, I could say, I'll show you some pictures here of my own garden, I wish. Uh, <laughs> but next time we'll talk about <laughs> landscaping and how you can make your yard look like this. I'm still waiting for my yard. Um, okay, questions? Got it. So we actually didn't have um, any other questions come in. We did have someone mention, um, obviously not advocating for anybody in particular, but Lowe's apparently will take plastic plant containers back if you're looking to recycle oh, yeah, them. Good. But you still mm -hmm. need to wash them out or have, mm -hmm. you can't have a lot of dirt residue in there, soil residue. Yeah, always a good idea just to avoid contamination. Because Lowe's anyway. might take them, but when they go to the recycler, if they're filled with, if they've got a lot of soil in them, they're just going to throw them away. They're going to put them in the landfill. So if you, you know, don't think you're going to have success recycling them if you take them to Lowe's dirty. Right. Just Good point. Um, some folks had asked about the first presentation um, that you made reference to during this one, and I did post the link oh, on good. the um, chat box. So if you guys are interested in seeing the recording and or the slides from the previous presentation, that's now in the chat box for you. Okay. Um, we've got lots of thank yous and comments for another great presentation. Well, you're welcome, everybody. Uh, and um, I'll send you a bunch of resources. And uh, if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me. 